Jesus, we love you, and we are really grateful for the opportunity that we have to be together. Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity to sort of dive into the Word and uh, just some practical ways to apply the goodness of God to our own lives. So, Lord, we just pray right now that you would speak into some of the dark corners of our lives, that we'd be able to be honest with ourselves, honest with you, uh, and even honest with each other. Lord, uh, I pray that you'd really do some healing or at least start some really cool processes in this moment together. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, my name's Steve Christ. I am the Young Adults Pastor here. So I, want, I thought it'd be cool to start out this session. Um, I would love for everybody to just sort of individually, we're just going to go one by one, just share your name, what you're most afraid of, and let's throw in who your current romantic crush is. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I figured I'd get one bozo in the back. <laughs> Just kidding. I was like, I'm either going to get crickets or I'll get somebody who's really honest about who their romantic crush is. Yeah. Like, why is that so unnerving? Why did the whole room's collective butt cheeks just clench? <laughs> like, why was that horrifying? It's really interesting as you, you know, look at this topic, anxiety and fear, right? That's the subject. Anxious and afraid. Anxiety and fear. Um, man, as I was thinking about this, I thought it was really interesting that if you really look through Scripture, this fear of rejection that you were just processing, right? Because it's not that you don't know your name, right? You all know your name. It's not that you don't know what you're most afraid of, or at least you're like top three, because you think about them regularly. You also know who you're romantically interested in, because you think about it regularly, right? It's not that you don't know this information. You weren't like trying to process through, oh, what's the answer to this question? You were trying to process through how willing you were to be vulnerable in front of other people because that process creates the very distinct reality of being rejected. Rejection is horrifying. And as I was thinking about this, it's really interesting because you were actually designed to fear rejection. I think this is one of those things in the world where we're like, you know, the world is sort of trying to teach, like, don't care what anybody or anyone thinks about you. Like, that's their problem. Like, you just be you. And, like, you were actually designed to fear rejection. All through Scripture, what, what's ultimately how this, this all ends? What's eternity? There's two places. Anybody know them? We'll test our Bible knowledge. Heaven and hell, right? I'll, go, I'll, I'll throw a softball to start it out, right? I'll do the, the, the one seed. How's everybody's brackets doing? Oh, Terrible. Did you get busted? I'm actually doing pretty well. but Not that I know anything about basketball. I just like to do this stuff. You were designed to fear rejection. Heaven and hell. Heaven is eternal uh, intimacy with God. Hell is eternal rejection from God. What, what was the punishment for Adam and Eve? Did God kill them for their sin? He goes, no, you got to go. you got to leave right now. What was Moses' punishment for not obeying what the Lord asked when he said to speak to the rock? And he strikes it. He goes, hey, you can't go into the promised land. He rejects him. You and I were actually designed for this. We were designed to fear rejection. We were designed for that to make us feel like really uncomfortable. Here's the problem. We apply it to the wrong things. Most of us, I think if we were honest with ourselves, we don't fear the Lord's rejection as much as we should. And we fear the rejection of the people in this room more than we should. Right? Like the opinions of those around you is much more... Uh, like why is it easy to sin at times? That should be horrifying to us to do something that we know God doesn't want for our lives. And yet it's actually a lot of times really simple. We can just sort of casually do it because we don't actually fear the rejection of God. But like owning up to something and just admitting in front of this room who you have a crush on. I mean, I thought I was going to have to clean some of your chairs like I think we have something that was actually built in and designed. Is the mic going out? Should I just send it loud? I think I can be loud enough. Is this fine? Yeah. We're good. We're good. 
I think we have something that was actually designed in us, but we like distort, right? So in Matthew 7, there's this really horrifying passage of Scripture where Jesus says, in the last days, many will come to me and they will say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not come to conference in your name? Did we not attend our youth group? And were we not faithful in serving? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. What's the point? I reject you. And that built-in thing, I think if we can grapple with that, it could actually maybe right some of the ways that we wrongly apply this fear of rejection to other people. Um, so when I was like 15, 14, I started leading worship. And the way the process started was before I think I was even really leading worship, we did a talent show my freshman year at my high school. Okay, so we were doing an original song. As a freshman, that's horrifying, right? Because there's seniors in the audience and senior girls, well, you know. They're attractive to freshman guys. I mean, I'm not going to like blow anybody's minds, right? He's like, true, true. <laughs> and there's the fear of rejection. Not that you ever have a chance, homies. I don't want to burst everybody's bubble collectively, but the fear of rejection runs deep, right? And so we're about to go out. So this is me, Pastor Dave, who's my older brother, me, Pastor Dave, and some like high school buddies. I'm about to do this original song. It was super sweet. Pastor Dave had like a guitar swing where like you throw the guitar and the strap brings it all the way around and then it catches it and goes in and like we did a jump together. It was, we were legit. Um, but right before we're about to go out on stage, I'm like backstage, no lie. Like we're, I don't know, 90 seconds from walking out. And all of a sudden I just go. <laughs> and I just like looked around like, what do I do? Like, who can help me with this problem right now? And I'm just like, and I book it to the bathroom and barely make like barf all over. And some of you could maybe relate to that, right? That like f the nerves maybe got the best of you one time or another. And like, you got sick to your stomach. That began for me the next, uh, I would say like eight to 10 years of doing that every week. There was no like eating disorder. I would have loved to have stopped if I could. It wasn't like I didn't like my body image and wanted to throw up. I didn't like my body image. I was chunky, but I, I just, I would have loved to have stopped, right? Every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night before going out to lead worship, I would throw up for, like I said, the better part of a decade. I'm past it now. But I'm 31, and this was like, we're, it was a long, long, long process. And as I was thinking about that, it sort of starts to become the question of, like, why? Like, did I not think I knew the lyrics? Did I not think I could sing the melodies? Like, did I not think I was capable? Like, what is, what is that thing in you? Is it that you genuinely don't think you could do it? Like before you step out on the court, do you actually not think you'll make any shots? Or is it really the fear of people seeing the few shots you'll miss? Right? It's not that you actually think you're, you're not going to make some. You'll probably even have a decent percentage. If you're on the team, you're probably not total trash, right? It's that the potential of an air ball in front of the girl I have a crush on is horrifying. It's horrifying to us. And as I was sort of praying through this process, I just wanted to, I think the Lord gave me a few different, like three specific things. If you're a note taker, I'm going to give you three simple things on how to sort of, how the Lord has helped me heal from this deep anxiety and fear. Because like I said, about a decade of my life was spent languishing in the fear of other people's opinions. Five more years, I would say, was spent healing from that to an extent where I was a functional human being, but not super helpful. Like, when I first became a young adults pastor, I can act, so no one knew this, but this is what was actually going on. I'd see a new young adult in the lobby, and I'd be like, I need to go introduce myself. Okay, you can do this. Come on, Steve. Oh, you can do this. 
Hey, what's up, man? I'm Steve. It's really nice to meet you. Well, he's the first time here? Like, and I would walk up. I could put the face on. I would make sure that you knew that I wasn't freaked out by this. But then we get into small talk, and the anxiety would start to build. And I'm like, I'm not built for small talk. Can we please talk about something real? Because I don't care about what you do for work, but I need to ask that question so that we can, right? And the anxiety was just this constant, like, and the Lord brought me to a place where I felt like he really delivered me from this. And I think there's three sort of really simple things. Number one, we're going to get right into it. Number one is you have to make up your mind. Can, does anybody have a Bible, phone app? Give me anything. Somebody want to look up John 5 for me? John 5, you're going to start in verse 1. When you got it, just raise your hand. And I'm going to have you read it, right? Can you do that? Can we do a public reading before, without everybody crapping their pants? Like, we'll be all right? John chapter 1. Send it back there. Give me through verse 6. Louder, please. Bethesda. Pause. Are we following? So he, Jesus brings him up to this temple area. There's a pool near it. And it says that here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. All right, loud. Next verse, please. Okay, so one who was there had been an invalid, disabled, immobile for 38 years. This story fascinates me. And as we apply this to your own personal anxiety, depression, and fear, this is the jumping off point for every one of us. Deep, gut-level honesty with where you're actually at. This is gonna, we're going to start between you and the Lord. Right? Because I lived for years anxious and depressed, and I couldn't figure out what to do about it. And over the course of time, the Lord actually started poking, starting at this process, right? Because what do you expect? A guy's been disabled, laying in this place for 38 years, okay? How many of you are even 20? Or let's go 19. A very small percentage. So this guy is well over double or triple of your total lifespan, he has been laying in the same spot doing the same things, the same process in his body. And so what it makes sense for Jesus to say, and what most of us remember from this story is, friend, pick up your mat and walk, right? Because that's our Jesus. Jesus is the compassionate one who reaches into our desperation and pulls us out to give us something we could never do on our own. Which is true, because that's exactly who he is. But how does he start? Next verse, nice and loud. Isn't that a weird question? Isn't that like mildly strange? Je she go he Jesus comes up and he says that when he had learned that he had been that way for a long time, he says, friend, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Number one, make up your mind. Because I think it, a lot of times it's easy to say, of course, right? On the surface, we always want out of our addiction. But do you? Do you actually want Jesus and freedom more than your porn? Than your anxiety than your depression or your cigarettes or your crappy relationship that you know you should have been out of six months ago? Like, do you actually want to get well? Like, do you actually want to be free? Because I know we all love the idea of freedom, right? But look at the freedom that you experience in this nation. We all love the idea, the expression, the experience of freedom, but do you want to go to the battlefield and defend it? Because most of us don't. That's why we respect those who have, because we recognize what a difficult sacrifice that was. And most people, we're going to get into steps two and three, 
But most people, we're going to spend the most time on step one because I think this is where most people skip. Most of us come to Jesus, come to the altar, come to a, a community of believers, and we start with the presupposition, the assumption that we want that, like, yeah, of course I want to get well. Why would I not? You think I like this? The Lord actually started to reveal to me that I loved my anxiety. It's just, have you ever been, like, you get in a fight with somebody, and you're, like, angry at them. Like, you're so frustrated because they are the most irritating person on planet Earth, right? I have siblings. So, if you have siblings, you've experienced this at some point, right? They are the most irritating person on planet Earth. And it reaches this point where you're like, I know it's not a big deal, but I really like being angry, right? Why? Like the negative emotions that we experience are usually far more attractive to us in the short term. The long term, we want to be joyful, happy, peaceful people. But we know to get to the long term, that would require us laying down the short term anger, fear, anxiety, depression, all these things. And that's never appealing. And so I think when Jesus comes to this question, this is where many of you need to grapple with for a minute. And we're not going to have, I'm just going to sort of barf it on you. And you're going to need to process through some of these things with the Lord, with your pastors, with your leaders, with your community of believers. If you're from here with us, that's great. If you're not, you've got to process this with your family, your God family. Do you want to get well? Like, are you at the point where it's like at any cost, whatever this takes, it has to be rid from my life? Like, this is not okay to keep this in me. Because I started processing this question. I want someone to answer me. Are you anxious and afraid because you're anxious and afraid? Or are you anxious and afraid because you're anxious and afraid? <laughs> He's like the second one. Are you an anxious person because you dwell on things that make you anxious? Or do you dwell on things that make you anxious because you are built to be an anxious person? I would say it's the first one. But most of us need to shift that mindset and make up your mind about who you are. You have to start with making up your mind about who you are. Are you an anxious, fearful, depressed person? Is that who you are? Because if that's who you are, there's nowhere to go. You're already doing great. You're killing it. Think about how well you are doing at what you do. I mean, like every day you get up and just slay. <laughs> like I should be giving awards, right? We, sh we should go into like a ceremonial process at this point. Or are you a son or daughter of God who has yet to fully learn how to lay certain things down? That is it. If you all have to walk out right now, I could be done if you need me to. This right here, if you'll really receive it, could genuinely change your life. This right here is what changed my life. The Lord finally started looking at me and going, hey, you know, I actually freed you from this a long time ago. It's just comfortable to you. So like, we're done whenever you want to be done. And I was like, B -b -but, I but I, I feel things. I feel scary things. He's like, yeah, I know. I, I, I'm not saying like you're not going to feel those things, but like the process of you living this way, bowing down to it every day, I, I actually took that out of you a minute ago, but this just feels good to you because it's natural and it's comfortable and it's a, a neural pathway at this point because you've done it so many times. We have to start with making up our minds. We have to start with deciding what we are, right? We have to start with trying to really allow the Lord to speak to us and allow him to be the one that shows me who I am. Like, what's my starting point? What is this? 
I want this image burned into your minds. <laughs> what is this? What is it? Is this, is this a cup? Did I not just pour water into it and then drink from it? Can someone else define that for me? It's a chalice. It's a cup. It's a goblet. Anybody ever been to Dixie Stampede? It's kind of like what they give you at Dixie Stampede, the, the boot cup in Dollywood. You have to decide what this is. Because just, I could find a million things right now that I could repurpose into something other than its original intention. And the world, your flesh, your past, the enemy, your mind, a whole list of things are going to actively try to convince you that if you're using it for a specific purpose, that's what it is. And so there's a lot of people Maybe some of you, if you were honest enough, could admit there's a lot of people walking around very confused at the world because everyone's wearing their cups on their feet. <laughs> and it does not make sense to them. Why are they taking the thing that I pull out of the cupboard every morning and putting it on their feet? They're what? They're gathering sweat and they're drinking sweat. Yeah. Yum! Yeah. Yum! My point is simple, right? You need to make up your mind. What are you and what have you repurposed yourself into are two different questions. Or even what has maybe your life circumstances repurposed yourself into? Are you a victim? Unable to ever rise above your current circumstances? Whatever they heap on me is just, what, it's just how life is. Are, are you a son or daughter of God that puts shoes on their feet, even if everybody around me thinks that they're supposed to drink from them? I know what the purpose of those are. I understand what this is. And so someone, you'll notice this was weird to you because it would be hard to convince you at this point in your lives that shoes are for drinking. But if you grew up in a culture where that's what everybody did, you wouldn't laugh at it. That would be very normal to you. And anxiety is one of those things. Fear in our culture is one of those things. It's becoming one of those things where that's just how we are. We're just an anxious generation, right? I'm a millennial, and as you go down the line to Gen Z, Gen L, they just get more anxious as they go. And some of you just live life that way. It's just, this is just how I am. That's how I was. I just lived life that way. It was just like, Steve, why do you throw up before you go out to worship? worship? Uh, you know, they, they thought that I needed to eliminate uh, like acidic foods from my diet. They thought I needed to try this. They tried putting me on Xanax. They tried every single thing and nothing helped. Why? Because ultimately I saw myself as an anxious person and I received that. That became my identity. So then when that's my identity, everything I do that's anxious feels natural because I am doing the things that it seems like I was built to do. And Jesus comes up and kicks this ideology in the teeth. He goes, hey, do you want to get well? And you know what he says? The guy responds back. He goes, I have no one here to take me down to the water when it gets stirred up by the angel. And I just imagine Jesus was kind of like, uh, not the answer to my question. Should we try again? I asked if you wanted to get well. And you just told me why life circumstances made it impossible for you to change. Is that not what we do? We have to make up our minds. You have to be able to walk out of here. And if you do nothing else, you have to be able to decide what are you? Who are you? What was the design and as we get into the rest of this, what are the areas in your life where you're deviating from design? We really don't like this in culture anymore. In Western culture, it's just like however you are, that's how you were intended to be. You just be you. And that doesn't work 
with a biblical framework. Because the biblical framework has some really specific things to say about how you were designed to work. And if I take the cultural norms and put them into car mechanics, I would be dumping my water bottle in the gas tank every day and shocked that I can't get anywhere. And some of you just need to recognize that there's a specific fuel designed specifically for you, designed specifically for the way you were designed. And if you would be willing to go, you know what, this is who I am, and that means this is what I need to operate, suddenly you'd find the machine operating at a level that it never has for you. Make up your mind. Are you a slave or are you a son or daughter who is yet to put these things into submission? Number two, change your mind. You know, when we talk about making up your mind, my wife was reading a book recently where she told me this example. I thought it was interesting. She said, he was sort of making the point that like, if you're trying to quit smoking and someone comes and offers you a cigarette, some people could go, well, I'm a recovering smoker. Which is fine. That's very much true. And the ideology that most of us walk with. But he said, what if, instead of going, no, 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 thanks, I'm a recovering smoker, you said, no, thanks, I don't smoke. Subtle, but you notice the difference? There's a difference in the mindset. One is, uh, I'm trying to decide who I am. One is, I've made up my mind who I am, and these are the byproducts now in my actions of the decisions I've made about who I am. So number one, we make up our mind, and once we've made up our mind, we are now freed to be able to change our mind. You guys know the, the biblical word repent? You've probably heard that if you've been around for even more than like five minutes. We use that a lot. Repent. John the Baptist and Jesus both came preaching this message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The, word, the Greek word repent that they were saying we often use as like a say you're sorry for your sin and stop doing that thing. And that's accurate, but it's not complete. The Greek word literally means, the, the Greek word is actually meta noia. Meta means to change. Noia means one's mind. So what they were actually saying was change your mind for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Isn't that a strange? It's the same thing that he did when he goes to him and he goes, do you want to get well? What, what, have you made up your mind about this? Like, have you decided at this point that you want me to fix this? Or are you still in the, like, gathering information phase? They come preaching. The whole message of Jesus, the whole message of John the Baptist, that then John gets taken out and Jesus picks up and says verbatim the same thing. Repent. Change your mind because the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance is not simply a recognizing the things that I do poorly telling Jesus that I'm sorry about them and trying not to do them again. Repentance is the process of going, I have made up my mind. This is who I am. And now I'm going to root, I'm going to like go through the whole system and ask the Holy Spirit to point out everything in me that does not align with what I have decided. Right? But what do most of us do? It's like, I don't know. I don't really know who I am. So it's like, uh, well, as something comes, maybe that's me. Maybe that's my thing, right? Maybe I'm this. Maybe I feel this way. Maybe I'm attracted to these things. Maybe I really want these things, right? And it becomes this really fluid, non-committal. I don't want to have to make up my mind because maybe the next thing that comes around will be the actual thing that I really want and fixes this hole in me. And we become really non-committal. That's me. I am the absolute worst at this. I am a man of my word, which is why I don't commit to things. Like if I tell you I'm going to do something, I will do it or I will die trying. But that's why I make the pool of things that I commit to really small because I know the level of commitment that I'll put towards that. So I'm really non-committal. It's like if you ask me, like, do you want to do this? I don't, you know, whatever. Whatever you guys want to do. I'm cool. So let's do this. Okay. And I think most anxious people, most people that struggle with a fear of rejection, depression, we tend to kind of be non-committal 
at the very least with how we see ourselves. This began to radically change my life. When I came to this place where I went, Lord, okay, this is who I am. I am not an anxious person. But you feel anxiety right now. I know. I am not an anxious person. This is not who I am. This is not what I do. And so I've decided now who I am. I've made up my mind. Now it actually gives me the freedom to start submitting to the Lord the things that are actually in my mind and actually changing my mind. Being able to go like, Lord, I really still feel these things. I recognize that I'm really still tempted towards these things. I recognize that I still want these things. I still want anxiety and fear. I remember one time, I'm going to try to give you some more practical stuff at the end, but I'll throw one out here. I remember one time I was sitting in my living room and the Lord was in a season where he was really walking me through this process. And I started to sense like anxiety and fear just like come over me. If you have struggled with this, you know that feeling where it just starts to get sort of like dark and you sort of tense up and it's like, oh my goodness, nothing is ever going to work ever. I'm the worst person on planet Earth and it's all going to fall apart. You know, like it just starts like overwhelming you. And I felt the Lord prompt me to just literally just do this. Lord, I thank you that I am not bound by anxiety or fear. And it just like lifted. It was literally just like, Lord, I thank you that I, that is not who I am. I thank you that that has no hold on me. I thank you that you have done that work in me and it is no longer a thing that I am a slave to. And I literally felt it lift. Like I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. A couple days later, I'm in the exact same spot in my living room. And the exact same thing happens. It was not like, I wasn't even thinking about anything specific. It just sort of starts coming over. And I literally did this. I went, Lord, thank you that I am no longer... Lord, thank you that I'm not bound. I couldn't say it. And then I'm like, oh no, I got a demon? Like, what's wrong with me? Are you a little panicky at that moment, right? I'm like, what is wrong? And I felt like the Lord was like, you don't want to say it. Because that sinking hole has become really comfortable. And breaking this pattern and this habit is a lot of work. It's an uphill battle. It's an everyday thing. It's a constant process. It's consistency that is a big commitment. I feel like the Lord's like, you're totally capable of this leaving you right now if you want to. And I was like, Lord, thank you. I just want to be sad right now. I was an emo kid in high school. I just lived... I straightened my bangs every day and I had like the curly hair. I basically had a bouffant, if you guys know what that is. It was unintentional, but it's just how it worked. This was pre-skinny jeans, right? Skinny jeans weren't a thing yet. And so we sort of started the trend by wearing girls' jeans and like bright pink backwards belts. It was a whole thing. I shopped at Hot Topic, if that gives you any context, right? I went from shopping at like Hollister, Stephen Berry's to like I came back the next school year. Like, yeah, like the front man of a, a hardcore band. <laughs> that thing was built over years in me of shame, of regret, of fear. A lot of my own decisions, a lot of fear about other people's perceptions of me. That thing was built in me over a really long time that I allowed it to become a part of my daily routine. And so in that moment, I'm like, I don't know if I want to commit to this. Oh, but I know that you're good, and I know that you've done real things in me, and I know that this is not what you want for me. Lord, thank you that I am not bound by anxiety or fear or depression. This is not who I am. And it lifted. But the reality is, changing my mind is my responsibility, because I have to submit it constantly to the Lord. He'll give me the tools for it but he will not change my mind. And you need to recognize this. He is so gentle and he is so... So this is not a gun. If I put my gun, gun to his head and I say, tell me you love me. Tell me you love me. Tell me you love me. <laughs> he said he loves me. 
Can I take that to the bank? Does he actually love me? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> the circumstances polluted it a bit, right? God is so committed to never putting the gun to your head. He is so committed to maintaining your free will that if this is how you want to live, you are free to live that way. He is so committed to that. He is so committed to never violating another human being's free will to the point that he literally, like think about this, think about the level and the amount over history of human atrocities. Think about just the Holocaust. But the awful things that he allowed to happen, and it's easy to go, where was God in all that suffering? God was letting humans do what they want. Because that's what God does. Because God is so entrenched in making sure that when you tell him you love him, there was no gun to your head. Like when my wife told me that she's going to never, like forsake all others as long as we both shall live. That's like the whole thing, right? That's the whole point. If I'm telling my wife on our wedding day that she's one of many, and maybe one day you'll even become my favorite. <laughs> but I got a lot of other stuff going on, so can we just be cool with that, right? Is that love? Love is like defined by the exclusivity, right? She knows I love her because in that very act, I said, hey, I'm foregoing everything else to focus my life on and with you. And that is the relationship the Lord is looking for with you. And so a lot of times we're looking for him to, Jesus, would you take away my anxiety? Would you take away my fear? Would you just, would you eradicate it from me? And he's sort of looking at you going, I mean, do you actually want to get well? And if you do, will you do the work necessary to change what's currently in your mind and replace it with something else? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when I read that, that is so fascinating to me that you can be transformed. He does not say your mind can be transformed by renewing your mind. That makes the most sense. He says you, your whole self, all of who you are, can be transformed by renewing your mind. By simply changing the way you think, by changing the way you see yourself, which allows you to now change the things that you value. Some of us, it starts becoming a process where we're willing to like eliminate things from our lives. Can we actually, can somebody give me, I'm just going to find it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it on my own. No, somebody give it to me. 2 Timothy 2.6. 2 Timothy 2.6. when we were trying to figure out in 2019 what to name my daughter. The Lord was in a process in a lot of ways similar to this teaching me sort of this subject. Um, can everybody do this? Raise your hands. Cool. Thank you. I'm just seeing, you can put them down. Just seeing some like tired eyes. I want to make sure we're all together. I'm going to get you done as soon as I can. We have like an hour and a half max left together. Everybody just got really anxious. Yeah, that's all right. We were trying to figure out what to name my daughter. And I heard someone mention, I heard a pastor mention, that you know manna's not bread, right? And then he moved on. And I was like, hold up. Wait a minute. I don't know the rest of the lyrics. I was like, no, 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 no. Homie, I went to Sunday school. Okay. <laughs> Did pretty well. Have all the stars still to prove it, okay? Uh, manna was definitely bread, so check your facts. And then I went and read it, and I was like, oh my goodness, manna's not bread. It was never bread. My mind was all over the kitchen, completely blown. Manna was flour, which actually makes a ton more sense. It was actually like a seed. Which makes sense, right? I always wondered why God just like strew bread all over the desert. That felt weird of him. Felt strange. 
Manna wasn't bread, manna was seed. Manna was seed that they were instructed to grind into flour, to form into cakes, and to bake into bread. And when I read that, A, the Lord spoke that we were to name our daughter that. We named her manna. But what manna represented to me in that place was God's provision meeting my participation. That he gave me everything I need, right? This is 2 Peter chapter 1. He says this, you have been given everything you need for life and godliness, having escaped the corruptions of the flesh. But just because I have the seed doesn't mean I have bread to eat. And it always, when I listen to that story, I think I grew up thinking that uh, I could be a little lazy because it's like, there's bread on the ground. Just go get it and eat. This is not that complicated. But what was he actually doing? He was going, look, I will provide what you need to sustain you, but you have to participate. Like, you have to work at this. Does somebody have, who had 2 Timothy? You got it? You have to participate in the things that God has laid out and provided for you. You have it? 2 Timothy 2.6. Loud. Loud. That's 2 Timothy? Is it 1 Timothy 2.6? Guys, that's my B then. Come on. That's my B. We don't know because if we were looking at it right now, we'll look at it later. I'm going to give you the scripture though. Paul says this. He says, for that spirit is not a spirit of fear, but of power, love. Okay, so we usually know that part. All the pastors in the room, do you know the reference? Nope. All right, you're with me. I don't feel so anxious. <laughs> but what we skip is the beginning of that verse. And I think we need to learn this. If somebody wants to look up the verse for me, I'll make sure everybody knows this when they can leave with their notes. It says that spirit is not a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. But before that, Paul says to Timothy, he goes, Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God given you through the laying on of my hands. For that spirit is not a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. You need to make up your mind about who you are, and then you need to willingly change your mind to fit the things that fit who you are. Paul goes to Timothy, and he goes, look, the spirit that came upon you when I put my hands on you, that spirit's not a spirit of fear. It's powerful, it's loving, and it's focused in its intentions. It's sound-minded. But you have to participate. You have to be the one. When it was placed on you, it was a spark. You have to fan it into a flame. You have to fan into flame the gift of God live, given you through the laying out of my hands. And if you will, then that spirit will become one that begins to guard you, becomes powerful over you, produces love through you. If you read Galatians 5, all of those things are your inheritance. Like that, you have access to be a person that from you flows love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. All of those things can actually bubble up out of you unintentionally. But we have to change our mind and be willing to eliminate the things that we know are not actually who God is calling us to be. He'll provide, but we have to participate. Number three, I'll close with these thoughts. You have to fix your mind. I have to make up my mind, I have to change my mind, and I have to fix my mind. I have to fix my mind on the goodness of God. And in that, he will fix my mind. Because you're messed up. You got to just like start there. You got to recognize that there are things in you that are broken for many reasons. Some your own, some other people, some just the world cultural system you were placed in at birth. There are things in your mind that have become broken. But if I'm willing to fix my mind upon who Jesus is, he will begin to actually fix things in my mind. This is like one of my daughter, 
her like favorite, like she has memorized this verse in uh, first or in Philippians four six through nine. You know, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are noble, and it's the cutest thing ever because it ends with she goes and think on such things, and she always says it like that. Think on such things. I think we like skip some of the simple things that the Lord gives us on how to combat these painful things in our lives. I want to actually read this. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything. Check and check. How are we doing so far? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Did you catch that? Put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I think sometimes we, we make like, the things of God so overcomplicated. Like, we make it so difficult. And he like, literally repeatedly throughout Scripture like, lays out like, equations. Like, do you understand like, the, the mathematical process that he just gave us to not be anxious, afraid people? Because he starts out with the, the other side of the equal sign. Be anxious about nothing. And you're like, show your work. <laughs> like, how did you get there? Be anxious about nothing. That, is, that, that makes me anxious <laughs> reading that. Like, that is so overwhelming. Hey, by the way, BT dubs, just be anxious about nothing. No sweat. And, uh, you know, be perfect, therefore, because I'm perfect. <laughs> right? Is that not how we read scripture sometimes? It's like, well, wow. Do I even try at this point? Like, is it even worth my time? But he starts off, you have to notice, on the other side of the equal sign. He goes, be anxious for nothing. And then he gives you the work. Then he gives you the actual equation he uses. In every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request before God. And then he goes back to the other side of the equal sign. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I think a lot of times as pastors, I've used this a lot out of context. It tends to be a scripture that we like pray over people to like console them. It's like, well, you just lost someone or you're going through something really crappy. It's like, man, I just pray that the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I don't think it's super helpful. Because the peace of God will guard your heart and mind the peace that transcends any way that you could possibly comprehend it. It will guard you if in every situation through prayer and petition you present your request to God with thanksgiving. This is the work. Ultimately, the fear and anxiety that we walk around with, that we wrestle with, that we like totally welcome in is completely incompatible with thankfulness. You notice, even in my own personal example, that's how it worked. Anxiety is starting to crush, and I went, Lord, thank you that I am not bound by anxiety. And the thankfulness in me about who Jesus is, and about who he's made me to be, that I have now fully accepted. And in the moments where I start to not accept it, I have a reference, I have a path to go back to, because I've clearly defined the path. So now I know if I'm in the weeds, or if I'm on the path. Many of you have, to def you have yet to define the path. And so you don't know if you're in the weeds or if you're on the path. There's no vision to your life because you don't know what the path is. Some of you, if you could just walk out of here and just go, you know what, the path is, I am a son of the king of the universe. He has created me holy in his sight, not by my own works, but he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of God. Because you know what happens at that point? I start to see certain opportunities and go, that's not righteous. That's not the righteousness of God, right? And when I define who I am, now what I do and the changing of my mind starts to actually make a lot of sense. And I become freed up 
to be able to fix my mind on who Jesus is. And at that point, he starts doing the work to actually fix you. I was talking with a really good friend of mine. He was a missionary in Tanzania. Um, and we were discussing sort of this process in my life. And he was walking me through some like really difficult, like, like wanting to get rid of some of this crap in my heart. And he goes, Steve, you need to recognize that what you're walking through right now, the Lord's trying to teach you what weapon is necessary for each situation. Because a lot of times what happens is we leave a moment like this and it's like, okay, cool, thankfulness. And you're getting anxious three days from now and it's like, Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, th thank you so much. Think, why is it not working? And you start getting anxious because that one thing didn't work and that's not the point. The point is not this is the specific way that you can fix all of your problems. And that's what I was trying to do. And he goes, the Lord's trying to teach you right now which weapon is necessary for each battle. Sometimes it's going to be necessary to work. If you actually look in Joshua 6 through 8, it's fascinating because in Joshua 6, that's the walls of Jericho. God says to them, don't fight them. I want you to just walk around and sing and yell at the top of your lungs. Okay, cool. Joshua 7, get up, take care of the sin in the camp. Someone has brought the devoted things into the camp. You need to take care of that and you need to kill the whole family. Okay, next chapter, go and attack the whole city and kill the kings. You just said to just walk around and worship that other place. The other place you just said to yell real loud, and that did the trick. Can we just yell real loud on this one? Is yelling still on the table, or are we like, is that, we got to do the fighting thing? We did, remember the yell, and it worked. Can we yell? No? Okay. And that's what we do. Is we go, well, this, this worked. <laughs> if you've ever seen Dumb and Dumber, here, Lloyd, this helps. And they're not, you know. <laughs> right? And we find the one thing that worked that one time, and then two weeks later, it doesn't have the same effectiveness, and we give up. Because it didn't work. I tried everything. That's always how we say it. I tried everything. It's like, no, you tried the one thing that worked a bunch of times, and it didn't work with the same efficacy every time you came back to it. That's not the same thing as trying everything. Sometimes we're supposed to worship. That's what he told him to do at Jericho. Just go around and worship. Just worship. Because I'm going to fight this one for you. Sometimes we're supposed to like go to others and work through our stuff or their stuff collectively, like in family, as an important relationship. That's what he does in Joshua 7 with Achan. Sometimes we're supposed to go and fight and raise the banner and go after what the enemy's trying to do in our lives and get hot and angry at what the enemy is trying to destroy in me. Sometimes he said, get up and fight. Sometimes he said, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. A lot of times we read those scriptures when we're walking through Hobby Lobby, and we're like, yes, I love that. We put that on our bedroom wall, and that's how we fight every battle. Well, the Lord will fight for me. I need only be still. Why is this not changing? Because he's like, hey, in this situation, I need you to take it. I need you to grind it into a flour. I need you to form it into a cake. I need you to bake it, and I need you to feed your family. Because I will give you what you need every time. But ultimately what this comes down to, because I think it's funny, what, I've, what I just told you guys is that there's a way out of anxiety, and then I ended up saying, there's a million ways to do it. And you're all going, I was hoping for the Tony Robbins wrap-up where you tell me exactly how to fix this. You have to, here, focus in with me for the end. You have to learn to hear the Lord's voice for yourself. Period. End of statement. This is how this works. I'm going to give you just some practical things that the Lord used in me to kill this thing in me. And hopefully they can apply to you and they'll help, but they won't fix it. Because he's not after giving you the 12-step plan to fix your fear and anxiousness and depression. He is after getting close enough to you to expel it from your life himself. What we're talking through right now are all of the barriers that we have up that don't allow him to get close enough to do what only he can do. Me thinking I'm something I'm not. 
me being unwilling to eliminate the things that make me that thing, and me being unwilling to fix my mind on the goodness of God. Once I do those things, I've actually dropped the walls to the extent that he will come in and start producing a different person in me. And I walked through this specifically in 2017. My wife, that was what, five years ago now? My wife, she's like, that was a year where you became a radically different person. Like, I fundamentally changed. I wasn't fixed. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Not even close. But this fundamentally changed in me when I fully submitted it to the Lord. And in that, he began to produce fruit by the Spirit in me that I was incapable of. For at that point, I was 27. For 27 years of my life, I had been trying to do this thing that I was incapable of doing. But when I finally fully submitted my mind, I decided who I was. I started changing the things in my life that made me that way, that made me think that's who I was. Shows had to go. Thought patterns had to go conversational patterns had to go, right? I had to start actually making hard choices and replacing them with fixing my mind and my heart on who he is. And when I did that, he actually started to just like show up and we became friends and he started to do things. He started to do things in me that I begged for, for years before that. He became so real. And so many of you just, you want out, right? You just want, you want the quick thing that'll fix it. That's not what he's after. He's after becoming so real to you that he actually becomes a friend who can speak into these areas of your life. Who can carry this burden with you. Who can speak in your ear because you begin to know what his voice sounds like in that specific situation where you're pulling out a sword and he goes, no, 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 no. Let's just worship today. We're just going to worship. Just, just, just begin to tell me how good I am. I'll tell you, like that right there. That right there was the key to 70% for me. Just beginning to thank the Lord that I was free. When I started to feel the bondage of slavery coming over me again, I would just begin thanking Him that I was free. Because slaves can be released but still not know where to sleep. And so when they go back in, it's not that they're slaves anymore. The door's open. It's that 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 place for years has become a place of comfort. And I don't know where else to lay my head. The Lord started showing me, look, the door's open. You don't have to keep coming back here. I set you free from this. This is not who you are, but it's really natural. So let's break that habit. And the way that I broke that habit was just constantly coming back to a thankfulness that he is good, to a thankfulness that he's real, to a thankfulness that he has set me free from this, to a thankfulness of the people that he's put in my life, of the church that he's given to me, of the family that he's given to me, of the, the wife and the kid. Like, it just came from a place, like it started in a place of just deep thankfulness. It started in a place of thankfulness for how far I've come. You got to be willing to just give yourself a little bit of grace, Right? you got to be willing to go, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was yesterday. And that's okay. That's not prideful. It's not prideful to go, Lord, thank you that I am not who I was two years ago. Because, man, that little win, that might put a little pep in your step to go, look, if I'm not who I was two years ago, what might I look like two years from now if I will give him my mind? It began to come to a thankfulness uh, for how far I've come. And then it just was brutal honesty you got to be brutally honest with the Lord. It was a lot of moments of me going, Dear Jesus, I have no idea what I'm doing. I do this one still every day, most days. I have a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, okay? So pray for me. Dear Jesus. I think I say that a lot, too. She does things, and I go, Dear Jesus, I don't know what I'm doing. There's, like, my honesty with the Lord, I felt it started to heal things. Like, Lord, I want to want to eliminate these things from my life, right? Because a lot of times we're like, Lord, I want this thing out of my life. And he's like, well, do you actually want to get well? Because it's going to be painful. I'll do it. And you'll be so much better for it. But do you actually want it? Because I'm not going to violate your free will. I started to go, Lord, I, 
recognize that I, I want to want it. That's a start. It was just brutal honesty. Lord, I want to want to be free of these things. And then it came to the honesty of, Lord, I want to be free of these things. And then it came to a place of, Lord, I am free from these things, and I don't have to live this way. I think brutal honesty with the Lord, it scares a lot of people. You think that he's going to like shame you. The verse that like set this thing off for me was Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Dwelling on the goodness of God. Man, just thinking about how good God is. When the situation's crappy and you're freaking out, focus your mind on how good God is. God, you're so, just say, literally say that. I feel like the Lord said, if you will just tell me for the rest of your life how good I am, your life will be well spent. Just tell him how good he is. Get other people around you who know what you're walking through, who are going to give you a minor spanking when you're not acting the way you should. Okay? Accountability is a huge piece of this. And accountability is not, I know, I know it's so hard. It's so hard for you, isn't it? It's so hard. You're just creating a victim. Accountability is, I know, look at me. That's not who you are, okay? I love you, and I know you're in pain right now, but that is not who you are, and that is not what we've decided the path is. Let's walk, yeah? Can we do this? That's accountability. Accountability is not, hey man, I screwed up. That's confession. That's confession. That's a part of it. But accountability is, dude, I'm really struggling with this. Look at me. Look at me. That is not who you are. That is not who you are, and that is not what we do in this family. That's not what we're about. You ready to go? Let's walk. That's real accountability. And you need some people around you who are going to hold you to that standard. And I'd end it with this fast. This is unpopular in every generation because fasting is painful. But I literally mean not eating. And I literally mean it that way. Okay? If you have an eating disorder, and I mean this with all sincerity, then you take this to a leader or somebody you really trust. If this is something you know is a stronghold in your life, then you take this to someone and you do it the way that in good wisdom you guys decide the Lord is speaking to. But for the rest of us, not eating food. They did not have social media in the Bible, so that's not a fast to me. Not eating food. What it does is it begins to starve your body and you are humbled by it. You're just in a different mental state where you're just like, Lord, I can't do this without you. Man, this, I was fasting this week and I just felt like the Lord like brought me back to that place where I was like, Lord, I am the literal worst trashy person on the planet and I am so thankful that you're walking through this with me because I can't do this without you. You're going to find specific ways to fight the battle that the Lord's going to give you. Claim them. Take them. Apply them. Let me pray with you. Jesus, we love you. I'm so grateful for this moment to share about the goodness of God to share your vision for our lives. But Lord, we recognize this is your vision, but it's going to have to be our version. Like you have the big picture vision for all of us to be anxious for nothing. But each one of us are going to walk out a different version of that. And I just pray as we walk away from this time together that there be specific things that latch in the hearts of everyone here. And as they walk away, there'd be specific, practical things that they can start doing to engage their spirit with you. To be able to walk free from fear and depression. Lord, we're thankful that you hold the future. You are good and you hold all things. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for being here, guys.